Welcome to the Startup Grind. Let's give a big Startup Grind welcome for Mike Maples. Here we go. I'll try not to embarrass Ann Mirako too much tonight by saying dumb things. Well, <laughs> we're, we're, we're filming it, so no one will see it. Is, is that working? mic working okay? Okay. Can you hear that okay? Awesome. Well, thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, go ahead. It's amazing anybody would want to hear what a VC has to think. Well, <laughs> you don't know these guys very well then. Yeah. I, think, I think you got pitched about eight times from the bathroom to the stage, so... Yeah. So, um, well, that's just because I have money, not because I have any <laughs> good thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell we like to start these off by uh, just getting to know you a little bit. Tell us about where you grew up. Tell us about what your parents did for work, and and uh, you know, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah. So uh, I guess um, I grew up as an IBM brat. So um, my dad started out as a, a systems engineer in Shawnee, Oklahoma. Uh, for IBM in the early 60s and um, you know my dad is very accomplished he ended up being the head of all products at Microsoft working for Bill Gates uh, by the time he retired and so he was promoted very quickly you know we went from Oklahoma to Princeton New Jersey to San Francisco to uh, White Plains New York and then eventually Bill Gates hired him and so um, that was kind of, kind of my early experience was all about change. And some people say I'm change seeking, and maybe that has something to do with it. You know, you made friends quick, you but you always knew that there was something on the horizon. You know, wherever you were right now wasn't necessarily where you would be. Uh, but he also just taught me a huge number of things as well as my mom. You know, what's, it, what, what's interesting is your dad, who totally independent of any conversation you and I have, actually was our speaker in Austin in the last month or two, and, and uh, you know, so you're the first father-son combo. Yeah, we're, and we were the, and some, and the Forbes guys deal. told me we're the first father and son combo ever on the Midas list. Oh, so he was in the cool. Midas list early in the 2000s, and yeah, for his angel investments. Tell, where, where is, so where is home? I call him the real Mike Maples. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where, where is where is home for you is is it you know you moved around all these different places where did you where did you where did, when you look back and say I'm from this place where do you say it, it's it's here it's uh, within anywhere near Stanford so Stanford was the first place that I'd ever been where the default assumption is idealism so so okay I hope I don't div divert this too much but Go this is it. kind of fun this is a fun story so um, most people think that Stanford came from Hewlett and Packard in the garage or from uh, Frederick Terman uh, in the engineering school, but actually that's not my point of view. My point of view is that Stanford had its roots in the gold rush. Hmm. And so Stanford was started because of gold rush money. And if you think about the gold rush, you say, okay, I'm sitting here in a river and I'm panning for gold and somebody right next to me fishes out a huge rock of gold. What do I conclude from that? Do I conclude that they're smarter than I am? Do I conclude that they're more able than I am somehow or that they're more persistent? Maybe what I should conclude is I just need to show up in the river. Part of it's about showing up. And so, you know, when I was a student at Stanford, you'd be sitting there in an engineering class and Scott McNeely would give a lecture or Steve Jobs would show up or, you know, Adam Osborne at the time that Osborne Computers mattered. Uh, but but whoever it was, you'd, you'd sit there and you'd look at that person, you'd say, okay, they're probably smarter than I am right now. They're not that much smarter. They just showed up. They took risks. And so Stanford was the first place I'd ever been exposed to where the default assumption was, let's be idealistic. Let's take risks. The burden of proof is the, on the people who are negative. Hmm. Everywhere else I'd ever been, you could take risks. But people would give you the thousand reasons you would fail. And you can never describe the reasons you'll succeed a priori. You could never describe why Twitter would have a business model back in the day. You could never describe why people would rent textbooks. Every startup's impossible at the beginning. And so Stanford was the first place that I ever attended where people said, that's a great idea. Why don't you drop out? We won't hold it against you. You can always come back. 
Uh, and so, so um, I believe that the roots of Stanford are actually the genetic code, the strands of DNA of Stanford are the gold rush. And this idea that just try, just have the courage to try, don't be afraid that it's wacky and controversial, just have the courage to try. That's, it's interesting because everyone has a story about someone sitting next to them or someone they've been to. Nolan Bushnell said something very similar. He's the founder of Atari. He was and in that class. Too he was. That in, I took. Oh, yeah, he did. He, yeah, I had lunch with him. Really? He's, and you know what he said? He said the best thing about America is nobody gets pissed when you have bankruptcy. <laughs> and he's like, no other country's like well, that. I was going to say whatever yeah. it was that he said. That was awesome. Be memorable. Yeah. But I, I was at EA and just down the street out of college, and I remember one of the founders of YouTube came right after they started. And he couldn't work a PowerPoint. And I remember thinking, dude, this guy at YouTube, he can't even work PowerPoint? Like, I, I can work PowerPoint. I could build YouTube. You know, that's obviously <laughs> not right. But uh, there's a little more to it than that. Right, a little bit more. But do you think, is that unique to Silicon Valley? Is it unique to this culture? Yeah, and YouTube, it, like, you know, I've got issues with We can talk about yeah, that later. Talk YouTube that makes hopefully. me sad in some ways, but Sorry. we'll talk about that. Yeah. Uh, so, but is, sorry, but is, that unique, is, it, is that unique to Silicon Valley that, that these people that just are all around you that are next to you that you know you, you see them and you can say hey he's not that smart or hey I, if he did it I could do it or is that something that happens around the world what's your experience um, I think that Silicon Valley has a cultural advantage of there is a widespread belief that you can have massively asymmetric high returns by expanding the pie and taking a risk. And there are other places in the world where there are people who believe those things, but there is nowhere in the world where that is the mainstream belief to the degree that that's true in Silicon Valley, and that's its fundamental competitive advantage. It's not that it has more marketing people or engineering people or PR folks or consultants or capital. It's Silicon Valley has triumphed because of that set of ideas. And, and the, the fact that it is the only place in the world I've ever been where the default assumption among most people is idealism mm -hmm. and growing the pie rather than claiming your slice. Uh, take us back, as you, as you came into Stanford, what did you think, what did you think you would do? What did you, what were you planning to do? Were you gonna go work at Microsoft? Were you gonna go work at IBM? Or what, what did you think you would, you know, you would edit, what would be your career going into school? Well, when I first started, my goal was to be uh, the, the president of IBM. Mm -hmm. and so my dad was at IBM at the time, and, um, and I still believe, you know, I, I think that the IBM company is a national treasure. Um, you know, you look, at, you look at other companies that have uh, faltered and how the boards conducted themselves and what they did to respond to the challenges. IBM's board did a kick-ass job of fixing the early 90s. You know, they, they took their job seriously, they brought in Lou Gerstner, they saved the company, and if you look at it, since Gerstner they had Sam Palmisano, they've got Jenny Romney now, they are the best example, the shimmering star on the, on the tree, I think, of good corporate governance consistently applied. Um, and that, it's not just that, but just the values they've stood for for a hundred years are just kick-ass. I think so. I think that they are a tremendously underrated company in Silicon Valley. I think they're one of the greats for what they stand for, for what they've accomplished, and just for for just how they conduct business, for how they practice the business. And so, it, it, you know, I knew that when I was a teenager. I saw my dad working there. I saw. Uh, what what kind of a place they were and what they stood for and so that was my goal was to be the president of IBM and why does the company mean so much to you is it because you, you were able to see the culture you were able to see the type of people that were building it and how good of people they were and you know there what why, why why does you know why because, is it so ingrained in you because they the they, of that company? they tried to be legendary hmm. you know they they were the first computer company ever that dared to be legendary and um, you know, they were just, there was a time when the computer industry was IBM. And, um, but, but they also, they held the title of being the best without arrogance. You know, so they had a, um, um, they, they, they had a lack of pretense about them that I really respected and still do. I, I, I think they are the best governed large tech company in the world. 
I don't. In, in fact, I can't think of a close second. So, so you, so you graduated from Stanford. You didn't go to IBM. You went to Silicon Graphics, right? Yeah. So, tell tell us, uh, you know, what what went into that decision? What was your thinking of taking that job? And then, how did how did that lead you into, you know, eventually starting your own company, which was, you know, which was several years after that? Yeah. Well, I just, you know, I just fell in love with Silicon Valley and. Um, at the time, you know, pro probably people in the audience are so young they don't remember this, but Silicon Graphics from like 1990 to 92, probably till about 94, 95, was just a great place to be. They had such amazing engineering, they had such incredible ambition, and, and I was just like, if I want to get the best Silicon Valley experience I could possibly get, that is the place to be. And so, um, and, and I have no regrets about that decision. I mean, there's so many great people there. You know, basically Netscape came out of Silicon Graphics and yeah. TiVo and uh, At Home and you know, some Clark of them were- Jim Clark was running it, right? Yeah, so, well, Ed McCracken, but Jim Clark was the chairman and he was the original founder. And, and like Tom Germalak who did At Home. Uh, th and there are so many companies that aren't famous that did infrastructure or network equipment or, executives throughout Silicon Valley. I mean, it was... That came from Silicon Graphics. SGI, SGI was sort of like PayPal 10 years earlier, right? It was the... Um, I used to say when PayPal started to work and there was the PayPal Mafia, I used to say PayPal is really the new SGI. And so it was just a great place to be from. It was, it was, it was Stanford values only more so. And they, they, they made some tragic errors that caused their demise, but it was just a great place to be. Great people loved it. Loved it every minute of it. And so you, so you, you leave there. You go get your MBA. Yeah. Is that right. Yeah. A decision you're happy with. Are you? Would you? Are, are you glad you did it? Or would you do it again today if you were? Uh, um, yeah, I guess you know. People, right now, it's fashionable to bash MBAs, yeah. and that's fine. Whatever. Um, um, not, I, not a lot of people bash Harvard MBAs, though, do they? Oh, yeah, they do, of course. Yeah. <laughs> well, the Stanford I almost MBA. have to explain it away. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but um, you know, I learned a lot there. Like, this idea that people who go to Harvard Business School are no good is just silly, right? I mean, come on. And so, so, so I went there. I met a lot of really smart people, learned a lot of really good stuff, no regrets. Uh, it hasn't hurt me too bad. You know, I just, I liked it. Yeah, it was good. It's been a nope. net positive. No, nope. it's been a net positive. You know, I'll, I'm, that's that's one that I'd, uh, that I'd do again. Yeah. <laughs> well, so and it's like, okay, so like, here's what Harvard Business School's like. So you'll be like, it'll be a case on like the American Cattle Company. You're like, whatever, who's the American Cattle Company? And, and who cares? Like, I'm never going to manage cattle. I'm never going to like, I have nothing to do with cattle whatsoever. Cattle don't obey Moore's law, right? So, so I'm like, okay, what fun is that, right? So, but then they'd say, and we just so happen to have the CEO of the American Cattle Company joining us today. Sure enough, he'd be sitting right there, right? So that's what it's like to be at Harvard Business School. You're just like, in the in the, so you're like at the West Point of capitalism, right? And and if you can't get something good out of that. You're a loser, right? I mean, that's it's a pretty good place to yeah, be for a couple of years. Yeah, but if you got there, you're probably not a loser, right? Well, who knows, right? But it's like there's a lot to get out of it. There's a lot to get out of it. Yeah. So, 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 tell us about tell us about Motive and how you started it. You you founded it. Was it late '90s? Uh, t tell us about how that came together and and what what happened. Yeah. So when I came out of Harvard Business School, I took this job at a company called Tivoli Systems. Yep. Which. Um, at the time, I took this job for $65,000 a year, which was less than I was getting paid at Silicon Graphics before I went to business school. Um, now, people didn't realize this, that I traded off some salary with for stock. So I went to Frank Moss and said, I really don't care what you pay me. Whatever the stock's worth, I'll trade a dollar salary for the shares and however many you'll give me. And so he's like, well, I'll do like that. that. I'll do that to a point, right? And so, so I joined 65000 bucks a year. And everybody I knew at Harvard Business School was going into investment banking or consulting, had these high paying jobs. And they're like, dude, Maples, you know, you could have been a contender, right? You were this tech guy, you're from Silicon Graphics, you know, you were a stud, you show up and you got less money now than you had then, you got you spent all this money to come here. What are you thinking? Austin, Texas, who's heard of that town, right? So, so um, and then like nine months later, Tivoli goes public. And, um, 
And everybody's like, Maples is the first guy from the class to have a big score, right? And so it went from you could have been a contender to you were the first the big score, right? And then, uh, and then not long after that, we got bought by IBM, hmm. which is kind of ironic. But when um, when IBM buys your company, you have a decision to make. You know, are you going to be an executive at IBM, or are you not going to be an executive at IBM? And um, well, you were going to you were going to be the CEO. Yeah, right? well, you know, I was, it, by, by then it was clear that I wasn't that material. So, um, so, uh, so I, I, uh, I ended up deciding with a bunch of Tivoli guys and as somebody that next had just gotten bought by Apple. Hmm. And I knew this, we knew this guy named Scott Abel. So five of us decided to start Motive and let's, you know, let's, you know, the internet was just starting to happen. And so we were interested in solving the problems of tech support on the internet. It, t solving the problems of tech support using the internet. And did you raise, did you bootstrap? What did we you did. So, uh, Jim Breyer of Excel, and then the Austin Ventures guys. Uh, it was Bill Wood and John Thornton led our seed round. No kidding. And then, uh, and then uh, we did the Series B not long after that, and we just you off came the up here. You came to Silicon Valley. You pitched. I don't know. Was Jim up well, here? Well, we were at the time we were lucky at the time. So uh, at the t actually, Jim Breyer and Peter Wagner came down to Austin. Wow. And we pitched them. They came and, down to see you, or they were just well, there? yeah. But I mean, we had met with them before, but they came down to see us to check it out and. And on the drive back to the airport, they told Scott Harmon, who is our CEO, okay, we're in. Let's do wow. this. Yeah. Just like that. It's pretty good. Yeah. And I'm glad we made, you know, we made him some money. It was good. So, um, so what happened? So you became, you became kind of the CMO, is that right, of yeah. that company? Yeah. And, um, and you stayed through the IPO? I did. Is that right? Yeah. And, it, and what, what kind of is going through your mind at that time? So you, you, you know, you've had these successes. You, you, you've really hit every mark right to this point. And, and then what, what are you thinking? What, what did you want to do? Why, why not stay there? Why not start another company? Uh, what was going through your head? So I was thinking about what to do next and I was thinking, should I get into the venture business? Which at the time, I didn't really respect the venture business very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, you know, it's the entrepreneurs who drive everything and why would I want to do? And, and second of all, it's really easy to disrespect somebody else's job. Mm -hmm. But what you realize is, Every job has a top 10%. Like a lot of people say, okay, VCs are dumb or they screw things up or whatever. I guarantee you there's a top 10% of VCs, just like any other business. And um, I learned this, this is a story I learned from my dad. So when he was a salesman at IBM, he calls on the CEO of USAA Insurance and they were about to get into banking. And my dad's like, huh, that's kind of funny. You're an insurance company, you think you're gonna be a banking company now. And the CEO of USAA says, well, gosh, you know, insurance is really complex. We have these crazy, complicated rate calculation formulas. It's like the most complex use of IT in the world. Banking, it's just debits and credits. <laughs> and, and so, you know, that ended up being like the worst disaster USAA ever embarked on was banking. And so my dad, like, taught me at a young age, you really ought to respect the other person's job because it's probably harder than you think it is. And the, the very best people in that job probably know a lot, just like the very best people in your job know a lot. And so I was like, why would anybody think I'm a good VC? There's just no evidence of that at all, right? I'd never made any investments. I'd never done any angel stuff. So I started exploring that. And then one day I came up to California, and one of the meetings I had was at Sequoia Capital. I'm sitting in the lobby of Sequoia Capital. They had this big plasma TV. And Can it, I just ask you something too yeah. about that? How did you get that meeting? Who who introduced? Do you remember who uh, introduced a friend? You or how a you got friend there? introduced me to Doug Leone. Okay. So so I was like, okay, friend, yeah, you take solid. that meeting. Yeah, yeah, take that meeting. So, but at the time, I didn't know anything about venture capital, right? I, and I didn't know who Doug Leone was, other yeah. than he was somebody important at Sequoia Capital, right? Okay. So so I went up there and I'm sitting there waiting for him, and um, there's this plasma TV, and um, on the TV it says Apple, Electronic Arts. Google, um, linear technology, Oracle, Oracle. I was like, Cisco, like, that's what I'm talking about, <laughs> right? And I was like, this, I need to come back here. And and at the time, so I came back to Silicon Valley without having a job, and I just said, I don't know what 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 it is I'm going to do, but whatever it is, it's going to be here because this is the place where the thunder lizards happen. Specifically, at Sequoia. Or well, just oh, no, no, just, no, just no, there no venture area, firm would have hired me at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> they had no reason to. 
Okay, but you made a decision. I mean, mind. you're not going to hire some random dude from Austin, Texas, who's never made an investment before. Yeah, it's just not going to happen. Harvard MBA, yeah. you know, Stanford guy, yeah. <laughs> slacker. Um, so, so, so you decide I'm going to come back. So you went, you went home. Did you go back to Austin? Did you pack yeah. up your stuff and just move out? Yeah, there, or and what? so I would, I, I would, um, I'd take the Sunday night flight. You know, because kids and family, I'd take the Sunday night flight, mm-hmm. and I'd stay out here till Thursday and come back. Wow. Yeah. And so what did you do? What was and there, the funny thing is there's people who are on those routes regularly, like who work at consulting firms or whatever. So I used to call them the bros. I'm like, hey, it's the bros. How are you doing? <laughs> it's you guys again. Yeah. <laughs> and what happened? You just, what, what did you do first when you got here? What did you do? You um, <laughs> well, so uh, somebody from Silicon Graphics named Paul Kuntz said, well, as long as you're going to be up here, why don't you hang out at Foundation Capital? Hmm. And so I was like, that sounds like a good plan. So I spend time at the partner meetings at Foundation Capital and look for deals and, you know, just try to learn whatever it was I could learn. And then I got really interested in, at the time, people were calling it Web 2.0. But it was basically the idea is the internet is shifting from uh, a web of pages to a platform of connected people and that uh, there's going to be a whole bunch of new things enabled by that. So I got really interested in that and I committed myself to being really smart in that area. And that's when I started meeting, you know, uh, Evan Williams, Kevin Rose, you know, guys like that. Well, let's let's start there. Let's start with, uh, so Evan Williams sold Blogger to Google. He had left. He was starting this company, Odeo. Yeah. H- how did you meet him? Who introduced you to him? Or h- how did that initial well, meeting, it, was it through this was yeah, it foundation capital? No, it was actually through uh, uh, Jeff Huber, who's one of the top execs at Google. Okay. So he went, he went to Harvard Business School back in the day. Um, fortunately, he's... He's a, a good guy too, who happened to go there, <laughs> and uh, and so uh, I was meeting with him, and and uh, and I was like, okay, I'm interested in these areas, and he goes, well, one guy you should really get to know is this guy Evan Williams. He's really sharp. He's starting this company, and I'm like, fill in the blanks. I'm like, Odeo, because huh. I like knew he'd started this company called Odeo, and he goes, you 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 really ought to meet him. Uh, he's a sharp guy. So he introduced me to Evan. And, um, because you yeah. had been looking at the whole podcasting market, right? Oh yeah, but I you, thought it was going to be huge. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so they were on your radar as a this is this is potential. Yeah, it was Odeo, and then it was a Pod Show was the other one. It huh. was started by Adam Curry, who'd been a DJ for MTV or VJ, I guess they called it. But like investing in a company, investing in a tech company started by a rock and roll singer <laughs> usually does not work <laughs> as, as, a, as a general rule compared to one started by a product guy. So so I was like, I think Odeo is the one that has the better prospects and and probably Adam Curry wouldn't have returned my phone call or let me invest but but so I mean I saw Odeo and immediately you knew. Uh, instant ignition gonna do this any way I can get in even if I have to trick people I'm gonna get in and so you start talking to him and he, he can see you have domain expertise you've been studying the market you guys hit it off how do you get in that deal because like you like you're saying you're new to the valley uh, you know you got a good introduction but how was it something immediately where you said, hey, I'm, I'd like to invest in this on the spot, or did you think about well, it? Or? Well, I wanted to right away, um, but Derek, I mean, i got to be honest with you. This is one of those things where I, I think that it was, the, it was the generosity of the entrepreneur. Sorry, I get a little emotional about it, but he had no reason to take my money. I'm, I'm not sure he could answer that question for you today. I think if you asked Ev, why'd you take Mike's money? I don't think he has an answer. Mm-hmm. I just think he was generous. And I think that um, I told myself what, whatever happened that, that we, would, we would remember that when we practice the business, that we would we'd ne- never forget that the entrepreneurs put us in business. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I get, get a little emotional about it. But, but, um, it's, it's important to remember because it's the same thing like with Kevin Rose. Like Kevin Rose at Dig, hotly contested deal, um, is another thing where there's no reason I was going to get in. And I threatened to go on a hunger strike in his apartment, you know, if he didn't <laughs> let me get in, which was an unconventional tactic. But um, so I got in on that deal. But those were the two entrepreneurs that I first backed, you know, Evan Williams and Kevin Rose. And um, that was a pretty good start. And, and then um, not long after that, so like this is also the generosity of entrepreneurs. So 
aggregate knowledge. By now I'm at August Capital because I can't get a job at Foundation. Hmm. So Dave Marquardt at August Capital says, well, why don't you hang out with us? It's You're like an like, EIR or what? Yeah, I was an EIR. Okay. And, 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 like, and, you know, why would anybody hire me? I mean, I, I'd still made no investments Again, ever. It doesn't make sense to me. I so, so, the company started. Yeah, so, so, I'm, so, I'm, so I'm, now I'm at August Capital and I run into this company called Aggregate. Well, it started out called Start Page 2.0. Terrible name. And it's Paul Martino and Chris Law, and they say, we got this company called Start Page 2.0. And I'm like, okay, um, terrible name, I hate it. And, and they're like, okay, well, here's what we do. And I'm like, you're not close enough to the money, this doesn't make sense. So they pitch us again, I pass again, pitch us again, I pass again. So one day, I get a call from Paul. He says, hey, we'd like to talk to you. I'm like, okay, great. So we go there, I go there to talk to him, and he says, um, uh, we just raised our Series A from Kleiner Perkins. And so I'm like, well, okay. And by now, ODO is out of business, you know, because po Apple gave podcasting away and ODO was about to become Twitter, but it hadn't happened yet. Yeah. And Dig hadn't really taken off yet. So now I'm feeling like pretty much a loser. And I'm just like, okay, great. So you raise money from Kleiner Perkins. Yeah, this is you telling me I'm an idiot. Congratulations, I'm an idiot. You raised your money. That's cool whatever, you know, and uh, Paul goes, no, that's not how we feel about it. You are the one who was honest with us and challenged us. And so we talked to Randy Komisar mm -hmm. and Kleiner, and he said, you can be an advisor. Wow. So we'd like to have you uh, be an advisor and we need you to sign a couple of agreements and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we you didn't we, invest anything, cool. but you just became an, a, yeah, a just became an advisor. advisor. Yeah. Wow. How and, cool. and so like, uh, that was another example where it was the generosity wow. of the entrepreneur, right? It was, you know, like a lot of entrepreneurs after the fact say, oh, thank you so much for believing in us and investing in us. But I really think we were the first venture firm that got started by entrepreneurs. Hmm. And so, um, you know, it's important to remember that. With Odeo, uh, Evan gave the money back to many of the investors, hey, Odeo, and then, and then he invited some to come back in, or, or depending on the stories, that, that you, you probably know the correct story. But, but it, the story is that not everyone was invited back, but the ones that, you know, George Zachary, yourself, there were others that, that they liked and that whose money they wanted again, and you were on that list, right? And so you got, well, tell, like, is, that, well, is that right? So is like that I said, right? I, I, I don't know why Evan let me do it the second time. You'd have to ask him, right? But, but um, uh, we'd like to. So, so, uh, <laughs> so, but, but here's the thing. He said, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna give you your money back. And I said, look, you don't owe me anything. I, you know, I made an investment. You win some, you lose some. I don't need my money back. And I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus here, but certain investors were kind of disenchanted with Odeo and wanted their money back. Hmm. And so he had to sort of come to an agreement with all the investors to give them their money back. Wow. And so I just said, okay, any entrepreneur who gives me 100% of their money back, I don't care what your next startup is. I don't care if it's a massage parlor. You know, <laughs> I'm going to invest at in. scale. Yeah. I don't even care if it's at scale. You know, it's like, as far as I'm concerned, this money I invested in Odeo is dead money. Hmm. And so it's, it's either permanently dead or it's dead till it proves it's alive someday. So, so um, I said, I, you know, so what are you working on? And he said, well, I got this side project. Okay, what, what's it called? It, well, we're not sure what to call it. Either voicemail 2.0 or Twitter. And it was spelled T-W-T-T-R. And I was like, I hate the fact that you took the vowels out because Flickr, that's, that's like what Flickr did. And you can't, Flickr did that, you gotta be, you gotta be your own thing, right? So, so, um, so I said, okay, great, I'd like to invest in Twitter. Hmm. And he says, uh, well, we haven't, um, we haven't decided to take money yet. And I said, well, whenever you decide to, I'd like to invest. Hmm. And so, uh, so, so I said, what does Twitter do anyway? And he says, uh, "It's a massage parlor." Yeah, and he goes, he goes, uh, "Well, you know, you, you you say what you're doing," and I'm like, "Okay, well, what happens? What happens after that? That's it." And I'm like, and he goes, "Oh, I forgot to tell you, 140 characters or less, because we want to be on cell phones, texting, text messages." Okay, what what, what happens after that? That's it. That's all it does. What's the revenue model? Uh, there is no revenue model. What's the roadmap? There is no roadmap. That's it. And I'm like, great, I'm an investor in Twitter. Just tell me your wiring instructions, when the time comes, I'm, I'm in. 
And I, I left that meeting thinking, okay, now I've lost the money for sure. Right? Like, <laughs> now it's like, it's over. But whatever, Evan's a good guy. I've already lost it once before. There's nowhere to go but up. That's right. You're yeah. playing with house money. So this is the other thing I've learned about the venture <laughs> business. One of the things I've learned about the venture business, I could sit here and tell you this story about how, well, I understood the strategic implications of blogging and the fact that microblogs would have an order of magnitude more exponential usage and adoption and engagement. But the fact of the matter is, I was just shit house lucky, right? And, and it's like, it's important that you recognize when you're lucky because I think luck is like a goddess. And if you if you don't worship the goddess of luck, she'll go give it to somebody else. And so, so uh, I worship the goddess of luck every day that I was part of that Twitter. How does project. one worship your goddess of luck? Because I'm, she think, seems to listen to your prayers. She's she's. I hope she'll stay good to me, but I keep worship her. Did you find her at Harvard? Is no, part of no, no, I did not. I did not. Yeah. Um, but the other interesting thing was until about 2009, everybody thought Dig was the better investment. Yeah. 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 But but and, it, and the interesting thing about that is too is I'm sure that that helped propel as you said at the beginning like those two things built your brand and and built your helped build your pipeline. But Dig, I mean that it, everyone was talking about Dig all the time. And that that's as I was trying to think like when did I first hear about Mike Naples? It was it was connected to Dig for sure. Yeah. And um, I wonder, and, and, and you subsequently, and this is another tribute to you, is that, uh, you know, I, Tony Conrad once said, who's a partner at True, once said that, that Milk, which maybe was not this massive success, but he said that that deal uh, was, the, was the hardest deal to get in of that, when the, that year that it, that it happened. And you were in that, he was in that as well. But, you know, Kevin came back, you funded him the first time, and, and you know, entrepreneurs, know who's who's good and they he went through one run with you and he said hey come back and invest again i mean i, I think that's a huge it's a huge tribute to you it's a huge tribute to floodgate and and um you know this mentality that you're talking about it's very i don't know i mean you i can you know you being moved by this is it's moving to me as an entrepreneur it's, but i can see it's moving to people in the audience because you feel it you believe it you you live it you know it's very it's authentic you know so I wonder what how is that is that just because that's the fabric of who you are because I I've probably interviewed three dozen of the top venture capitalists in the valley and I probably never felt I mean you, you're gonna feel weird I say this, but it never felt someone that I felt was so authentic about believing that so what why how are you like that why like how can somebody that wants to be like that what what attributes do do I need to to get to to, to kind of to get that in, ingrained in me? What do I need to do? Well, I, I guess a couple of thoughts. First of all, you know, to me, sort of the entrepreneur is the greatest, is it, sort of like the greatest force in society's food chain, right? Like entrepreneurs are the only people who create something out of nothing. And, you know, so I always looked at it like, you know, the the, the heroes of the world are the entrepreneurs and the veterans, right? I'm not sure how I'd rank them, but, but I just always looked at it that way. And um, now, okay, so now there's a lot of entrepreneurs and they're heroes, but then there's even a subset of them who dare to be legendary. And, um, you know, it's a, just a very rare thing, but every now and then you just encounter an entrepreneur who wants to do something totally legendary. And that's what I'm in it for. And so it's not, it's not some calculated thing. I'm just like, there'll be 10,000 companies started this year and 10 of them will be legendary. And that's how I want to spend my time with those people. And um, you know, when, 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 you, when you're lucky enough to get involved with one of those, it's just the gift that keeps on giving. It's just a fun ride and it's awesome. And it, you know, it just has a, a positive impact on things. And you know, I just want to be one of the good guys who was part of that. What, what does that mean? A legendary entrepreneur? Tell, give us some characteristics of that, or had, you know, what, what attributes do these people have? Yeah, so there are a couple things. So first of all, um, I think a lot of people who start companies, just like a lot of people who invest, are just kind of doing startups. And that's different from saying, I'm going to do something that's going to make a fundamental difference. Uh, so part of it's just a state of mind. Right, um, but but part of it as well is a a set of thought habits. So, you know, the metaphor I like to use is the difference between Newton and Einstein. So Newton 
came up with a set of theories of, quant of, uh, of physics that are fairly intuitive. Like if I drop this microphone, I won't do that, but if I were to drop this microphone, it will accelerate according to uh, time squared, right? But, you know, when Einstein came up with the general theory of relativity, people kind of thought he was smoking weed, right? You couldn't, you couldn't <coughs> prove Einstein's theories in a lab. You know, in fact, the term thought experiment came from Einstein. Uh, you know, imagine an elevator's traveling at the speed of light up, up, upstairs, right? So, so it, in fact, the general theory of relativity was proved, I think, I could be wrong a little bit on the history here, but like seven years after he postulated it, and they had to have some boat out in the middle of the ocean, and it was, there was some kind of an eclipse, and where are the sun rays going to bounce, and if they bounce here, Newton was right, and if they bounce there, Einstein was right, and that was what made Einstein world famous, was his, prov his theory was basically proven that day. Because otherwise, there was like five people in the world who could even make sense of what he was saying. So how does that apply to entrepreneurship? Most entrepreneurs tend to gravitate to the ideas that are linear. They tend to gravitate to ideas that involve reasoning by analogy. Uh, they tend to gravitate to ideas that make intuitive sense. And what, one of the things that I've learned about the really great entrepreneurs is they tend to think exponentially. And none of us think exponentially as part of our intuition. You know, we drive to work every day, we brush our teeth every day, we comb our hair every day, we do those things every day. Those are linear activities. And so everything we know about this world we live in is linear. Everything about the, the, the genes in our bodies and the, the, like the, oh, their experience growing up to this point as a species is, is linear. But, you know, like Evan Williams, I mean, yeah, I was really lucky, but one thing he said really resonated with me at the time. He said, I figure that if a million people write blogs, maybe 10 million people would write microblogs. And if that was true, if that's true, then the burden of proof is going to be on the people who are negative. And so, you know, Reed Hoffman was the first person I ever met who talked in terms of a rhythm of doublings. I'm going to double my user base every six weeks for 18 months. Uh, and so, Elon Musk, this is my favorite example. So Elon Musk says, I'm not a faster, more efficient version of NASA. His insight's more profound than that. He says, 0.3% of the cost of a rocket is fuel. And the rest of it gets burned up because it doesn't come back. So what if I made a reusable rocket? I could make space travel 100 times more cost effective if I could do that. And so the, thing, the fundamental thing I've seen in the great entrepreneurs is they have an exponential insight. And, you know, if I were to reduce the task of a great entrepreneur to a simple sentence, it would be, how am I leveraging a current change in technology that follows Moore's law to create an exponential outcome that's one of the 10 best companies of the year? And that's what I'm looking for. You know, that's, that's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm in it for. And, um, you know, I'm probably wrong more often than I'm right. But when I'm right, I'm spectacularly right. As an entrepreneur, how do I know whether I meet that criteria or not? Do I just put it through that equation? Hey, am I am I hundred yeah. xing the you know what what do I do? How do well, I, I, yeah. So so people like so the next and it's a related question, but people will say, okay, well, how do you? It's easy to say that. How do you find those? But the reality is, you know, we'll get like two hundred business plans a week this year, and I can eliminate one hundred ninety five of those based on that one question. Is this entrepreneur trying to create an exponentially increasing asymmetric returning business? And so it's more of a process of elimination. You know, if I if I eliminate 99 plus percent of all business plans you right can away, deal with the rest. I can I can I can look at 100 plans a year seriously, hmm. and then 10 of those are going to be truly awesome. And so if if I can somehow find a, a better way to even improve my hit rate even a little more than that. Then I got a shot. You're kind of famous for this term, thunder lizard. I wonder if you could just tell tell us a little. Who's heard that term before? Okay. Okay. Infamous. Third, maybe, third, of the yeah. room, okay. third of the room. Tell us about so, it. So yeah. So so um, one of the things when I was at business school, people would use sort of MBA sounding jargon. You know, like uh, um, and and by by the way, I mean no offense to Clay Christensen because he is a wonderful, awesome guy. Uh, who yeah, I he's met twenty years ago. Grind, so. and, and he's he's awesome. Like. Uh, how and will his you co-author is in the room right yeah. there. James. I mean, like, how will you measure your life 
is my yeah. favorite book hey, the last five James years. James Co James is a co-author on that book right there. Third, raise your hand, James. That's one of my favorite. No books. No kidding. Too. Yeah, that's awesome. That's an awesome book. Like the whole like just this once fallacy of you know, yeah, and not playing basketball is just a great book. It's yeah, it's great easier book. to keep your it's easier to keep your standards a hundred percent of the time than it is ninety nine percent of the time. Right. 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 Yeah. right. And so, because 99% drifts into not keeping them. That's right. Right? And so, but, but anyway, so, but they would use terms that are kind of MBA sounding like disruptive innovation or yeah. core comp, this wasn't a clay term, but like core competency or yeah. things like that. And what I found was that a resonant term with entrepreneurs was this term thunder lizard. And uh, thunder lizards, uh, the metaphor comes from Godzilla. So Godzilla the legend says was uh, hatched from radioactivated atomic eggs and swam across the ocean and started to destroy cities. Started to chomp on boats and started to chew on cars and throw uh, tra train cars around like they were sausage links and um, you know breathe fire on buildings and swipe holes and things and all that stuff. And so I was like, sounds more like a VC, doesn't it? No, I was like, that's no, that's the metaphor of a disruptive startup. Yeah. You know, like something, and and by the way, it has to start with radioactive eggs, right? And so, so like, <laughs> my job is to figure out, are you coming from radioactive eggs, or are you just doing a startup? It's a big difference. And so, um, and idea. most people, if you're honest, are just doing a startup. They're doing it because they're attracted by the romance of it, or they're doing it because they know something. But very few entrepreneurs step back and say, I want to build something that is exponential and world freaking class, and there's no plan B, right? And and um, those people have thunder lizard ambitions, and that's what I'm in it for. And I've, by the way, I have nothing against entrepreneurs who do it the other way. It's just that's not what I'm in it for, and so I'm real clear about that. Yeah, and I, you have this analogy. You you said this analogy too, which I love, which is, I'm I, I know how to win, or my goal is to win the Super Bowl, yeah. and anyone that wants to win the Super Bowl. Or the World Cup. That's what I want to win. I don't know how to win the little league. I don't know how to win the you know the the AAA league or the D league. I know how to win the NBA Finals or the Super Bowl. That's that's where I want to play. I think that's that's a you said that right. I think yeah, that's, that's my goal. And I'm by the way, I'm not saying I'm God's gift to winning or I'm you know Mr. Super Bowl guy winner. But but what I am saying is that when an entrepreneur comes to me and says, "What if my ambition is to have a twenty million dollar exit? What what advice would you give me?" I say, I'm not qualified to give you advice because I don't care. I, do, I don't care about that. And so I've never thought about it. It's not, it's, it's not in my playbook to help you have a $20 million exit. Maybe, maybe that's the safety valve exit, but you should work with me if you want to create a legendary company. And, um, and if you don't, no offense. If you think my expectations are too high, I'm not offended. It's just I'm going to be real clear about what I'm in this for. And by the way, I don't deserve the credit when it happens, and I don't deserve the blame when it doesn't happen. But that's what I'm in it for, and um, you know, that's it. Life is short. How does it? How does an entrepreneur get an unfair advantage in, a, in with his startup? What What does that mean to for for an entrepreneur to to just? It's unfair how, how far you know ahead that they could possibly be. What What, what is it? Well, what the, makes the, that so up? the first the first notion I think of unfair advantage is that. Um, so this, this is going to be Harvard Business School sounding too, but like a lot of people that I know, if you said define capitalism, they would say something like, it's a system characterized by competition for limited resources and market clearing prices and you know, trying to appeal to the customer. It would be something like that, right? Whereas uh, Peter Thiel once said something that I think is insightful, um, a capitalist is really someone who gathers capital. And so a true capitalist competes by avoiding competition. Capitalism and competition, it turns out, are not synonyms, they're antonyms. And capitalism and competition, because they're opposites, the great competitor refuses to compete. The great competitor, I call it Jerry Garcia's law. So Jerry Garcia was the lead singer of the Grateful Dead, someone who I got to watch while I was a Stanford student. And one time he was in this interview and he said, I don't try to be the best, I try to be the only. Hmm. And so few startups get that. I get so many pitches where it's like, 
here's me, here's my competitor. I have 10 checks in the box and they have eight checks in the box. And I'm like, it's axiomatic that we're not gonna be able to work together because you're not trying to be the only. Like when I saw Smule and they did like the Ocarina and they did IMT Pain and all those apps, they were the only version of what they did. They weren't trying to be a better flute than the next guy. They weren't trying to be a better auto-tuning app than the next guy. They were trying to be the first and only of what they did. What's Twitter? Twitter is the only of what Twitter does. Facebook is the only of what it does. And the real opportunity presented by the internet in general is, um, you know, my dad worked at IBM and Microsoft, so he said, be careful about using the word monopoly ever uh, because it'll offend <laughs> some people. But the, the internet creates the condition for smart entrepreneurs to create a natural monopoly. And if you think about all great internet companies, that's what they did. eBay, well, I don't want anybody to be offended. eBay, Google, um, Facebook, maybe some companies I'm involved with, but I won't say. But, but it's like the goal, the goal is to be the only and not the best. So if, a, if an entrepreneur is not the only one, yeah. and yet they have these insights, does that mean they just have no opportunity to become the best? Or, or can you still become the best even if, if there are other players you, in you, the market? Do you just... Oh yeah, sure. But, but it's like, I like to look at it as like a matrix, right? So you can be right or wrong, and you can be consensus or non-consensus. If you're wrong, you're just hosed, right? If, if your idea is wrong, you go out of business, you run out of money, you can't overcome that unless you get bought by a stupid company, right? But that's, that's rare. Now, if you're right, it turns out that that's not always good. If you're right, but you're in a crowded market with a lot of competitors, yeah. the profits can get competed away. The acquirers have more leverage. It's harder for you to get traction because you have more competition. And so I like to say that like a, a startup is sort of like um, a baby wildebeest born on the Serengeti plain in Africa. They, they fall out of their mom and they're in this sack and they, they squirm around for a couple minutes. If they don't get up and run in the next three to five minutes, it's done. Nubian vultures start circling, jackals show up, hyenas, you know, mom's out of there, right? Uh, because it's the, like the wildebeest migration. And so that, that wildebeest is toast. And so when you're a startup, you, it helps to have some time to develop your idea and to, to like screw up with customers a little bit here and there. And the reason is, so, so how does that happen? It happens when nobody really cares what you're doing. And so like, everybody's like, well, how did you pull this floodgate thing off? Well, the only people who were doing that kind of investing back in 05 and 06 were me and Josh Koppelman. Hmm. We, weren't, we weren't winning by virtue of out executing people. We were just the only guys that showed up. And there's a huge advantage of being the only. Always. But if you look at some of these companies, and I mean, I, the, the ones that come to mind immediately are uh, like, does Juan Nilo, which I know you're, it's, it's at a floodgate investment, it's not, yeah. if Ann's on the board of that, yeah. but do, does does uh, does Pinterest have to fail for Juan Nilo to be no. successful, or does Uber have to fail for Lyft to be successful, which you guys are in? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're in the same realm, but right. you know, you hear these, I, I, I mean, I heard, Lo, I, we had Logan two days ago, and, and he's you know, awesome, isn't amazing, he? Yeah, yeah, amazing, and, and he probably knows more about that space, has thought more about it over the last ten years than anyone in the world. I mean, yeah. he yeah. he has just been in it for ten years, you yeah, know, since he was in college. But yeah. but but is is it a Mad zero? Mad props to Anne for finding it. It's amazing. Yeah. Is it a zero sum game? Uh, you know, is no, it? No. So so this is the thing. Like, I just don't think Uber and Lyft compete. Now, I think Travis believes that they do. Yeah. But clearly. I think that that Travis, unfortunately, is engaging in mindless competition. He's doing what I'm describing as the wrong thing. Lyft doesn't have to fail for him to succeed. He's got a great business. And nobody, nobody I know who rides Lyft is saying, oh, gee, should I take Uber or Lyft right now? They're just totally different, right? Look, car pulls up with a pink mustache with sort of like this casual slacker element to it. It's just different from a black car pulling up that, you know, it's like, am I going to pay half the price of a taxi cab and drive the pink mustache car with the guy who fist bumps me? Or am I going to pay 2x a cab and drive a black car that the premium price product? But their, their vibe and their sensibilities are just totally different. And, you know. But you don't think they're addressing similar markets? I mean, you I think, think they're, but, but, you know, the point is that leaders run from the front. Yeah. And 
Travis doesn't have to have Lyft fail for him to succeed, and Lyft doesn't have to have Travis fail for them to succeed. And um, this is why the reason Lyft succeeded in a crowded market is they, they, they were different in ways that were relevant to customers and that captured their imagination. You know, you got sidecar, you got get around, you got relay rides, you got a bajillion ride sharing services. And then Logan comes out with this, you know, put the pink mustache on the car and be like this authentic. Everyone's a family. It's like everyone's a, a family. Community. It's like an authentic community, yeah. passionate kind of thing. Whereas I look at Uber as more of like a premium product. And I think they're awesome. Yeah, I think both companies are awesome. I think they'll both win. Um, I think that, that Uber might decide to spend a lot of money to try to put Lyft out of business. It won't work because they're just different. It's kind of like when IBM tried to put Windows out of business by spending money on OS2. It just didn't work. I wonder if you, um, we're going to take some questions from the audience uh, in just a minute. So if you have them, get ready for them. Um, this, this experience that you had, we talked about YouTube at the beginning and, um, uh, you know, I know this experience had a huge impact on you, and I, and I think that it's a great story for entrepreneurs. Um, but would you mind sharing, uh, you know, you, your, your, this experience that you had with the founders of YouTube? You, you, you're doing this early investing. Um, you're just starting to get into a couple of these deals. And, and what, t tell us what happened. Tell us what happened. Yeah, so that. it was, it was uh, about two weeks after I had invested in Odeo, yeah. and, which was a tough time because the week after I invested in Odeo, which was a podcasting company, Apple decides to get podcasting away on iTunes. Like literally two days after I'd wired my money in. And you know, you'd say, well, that's not that big a deal. You know, there, there are gonna be lots of ways to consume podcasts, but you're like, come on, Apple has a monopoly on the playback devices. So clearly everybody with an iPod is gonna take free podcasting from Apple. And so you're like, okay, well, there's still a market other than iPods and you're like, well, not really. And so we're like, we're kind of hosed, right? So that sucks. So then, then up comes YouTube, and I see it on TechCrunch. And at the time, you know, if you look at the very first article on YouTube on TechCrunch, it basically described it as like Flickr, but for video. And, and I was like, that's pretty cool. And I think that video is more monetizable than photos. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go try to try to get in this YouTube deal. Well, nobody from YouTube knew who I was. And yeah, you know, it's just some random guy. Did you right? just cold call him, or did no, you? No, no. So I was having breakfast with Reed Hoffman, and I, first breakfast I ever had with him, first time I'd ever met him. Wow. And I said, "Hey, Reed, I think this YouTube thing's going to be big, and I know you know these guys because they're from PayPal. And so, what do you say we would go in on this thing together?" <laughs> and he's like, "Hold on a second, big fella. You know, I've known <laughs> you for five minutes." And, and I was like, oh, well, I'll do the best I can. I'll add value. Is that exactly what he said? Or is that, well, do you remember exactly? Pretty much, it was pretty close. Pretty yeah. close. That's probably not his exact, that's kind of the Texan spin on it. But, but that was close to like how he was talking. And so, so but, but we had a really nice conversation. And Reed is just a, we could talk about him some more if you want. He's, he's just a great guy. He's, he is a national treasure. Um, but so, at, you know, afterwards, he's like, okay, well, Here's the thing, we're gonna create this angel syndicate. It's gonna be me and Peter Thiel and a couple other guys, Keith Raboy, I think it was. Um, and, uh, but the issue is that we're gonna compete against Sequoia because they're gonna, they're gonna try to do this. And I was like, well, why would we wanna do that? You know, like, why can't we just be lovers and not fighters? And, and at the time, <laughs> Peter, P Peter Thiel was kind of mad at Sequoia. And so, so he's like, that's not really how Peter rolls. You know, uh, we're gonna have to compete. So Sequoia ends up winning the deal. And it was like watching, you know, like it's like watching a hot air balloon drift off that you can't catch. And you knew it all along and you saw it and you watch it have this huge, awesome exit. And it was just, just devastating, just devastating to watch. But, I, but congratulations to them. They clearly did just fine without me being involved. But what, but what did you learn from that deal in particular? You learned, you I learned, learned that I would never lose a deal because I didn't have enough mojo to get in it ever again. And so like that's why I threatened to go on a hunger strike in Kevin's apartment. I was like, this dig because thing, I got to get from in. YouTube. Yeah, I was like, I am not going to lose this deal. You know, I'll be, it may go out of business someday, but I'll be damned if I'm going to lose it because I want in this thing and I'm going to fight and I, I cancel all my meetings, cancel whatever it is else I'm doing right now. I have to get in on this deal. I'm not going to let this be the next YouTube. 
<laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I've made three types of big errors. YouTube was one, not having enough mojo to get in. The second one was passing on Zynga and Airbnb. That's passing on deals where they came to you, you had a chance, they asked you to come in, and you said no. Then the third type of error is just you never saw it. Like, I never saw Groupon. And those are those are the three unforgivable sins. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting. I mean, that you know that you may have missed out on that, but look, it, it had a, it had a big impact going forward, right? You learn from them that you learn from what happened. It's not even a mistake. It's just you learn from what happened, yeah. and it had this huge impact because you you vowed it would never happen again. And yeah, and you know sometimes the goddess of luck is with you, and sometimes it wasn't your day. You know, you win some, you lose some. You've won a few. So let's give Mike a big round of applause. We have some questions. Let's uh, take some questions. Uh, Taylor, yeah, go for it. Um, what, are, uh, what are some ways that you might kind of give us to uh, kind of get better at exponential thinking? Um, if that's something that you can get better at. Yeah, How can entrepreneurs get better at exponential thinking? Okay, so there are, there, are, um, there are a couple of interesting diagnostic questions. So uh, the, first, the first question I like people to consider is, uh, what is my fundamental secret? Uh, what, what do I believe is true that the rest of the world does not believe is true? And why is it that by virtue of my wisdom and insight and experience, I'm right and they're wrong? So, you know, Evan was in a position to say, I think microblogs will work, because he'd started Blogger. And so, so the first thing I really look for is an authentic entrepreneur who you say, I can't imagine them starting anything but this idea, given who they are, and they have a non-consensus and right view of what's about to happen. Yeah, that's the first precondition. And I call that just, what's your secret? Uh, the second thing is, um, what is your fundamental advantage? Time to market, not a fundamental advantage. Better, faster, cheaper, not a fundamental advantage. So um, most people are not able to answer, I'm 10x better in this part as part of their question. Or at scale, this is a monopoly network. Um, by the way, this is why LinkedIn, LinkedIn is impressive to me not because it has a lot of users, it's impressive to me because Reed Hoffman had a vision that he was building a network and that some of the best most valuable businesses throughout all time, whether it was Jay Gould and the railroads or uh, Rockefeller and Standard Oil or McCaw with the original cellular networks or the original radio guys, a lot of the most valuable businesses of humankind have been proprietary networks with a single source supplier of that network. So I'd say those two things. What's your secret? What's your fundamental advantage? And then the third question would be, why now? Like, why, why is it that your startup can exist tomorrow but not yesterday? What is it about the technology landscape that's changed, that's created the catalyst, you know, that's created the wave for you to surf on that didn't exist before? Other than that, there's about a million details, but those three are pretty good start. Awesome. Yeah, go for it. Does the quality of your investors matter? Does it, how, how important is the quality of your investors? Um, well, if it's not important, then ultimately we don't have a business. Because uh, right now, particularly in the early stage in seed, capital has been totally commoditized. You know, you have um, uh, one, of my, one of my LPs, an LP is like somebody who invests in a venture firm, told me they get a new micro fund pitching them every day. Um, Google is doing probably more than 100 seed investments a year. There are hundreds of accelerators. Most venture firms have these stealth seed programs. Uh, you have all these Facebook millionaires who want to do seed investing. And so in an environment where capital is a commodity, um, I cannot make money as an investor unless I have an advantage that the entrepreneur values. In the end, I have to think just like an entrepreneur. I have to have an advantage that's fundamental that the entrepreneur values. And that's what gives me the right to be paid by having a lower valuation or higher ownership than somebody for whom capital is a commodity. 
But in terms of whether it matters who your investors are, um, uh, I think that it does. I think that there is a limited subset of investors who really are trying to help people build companies. Uh, there are a limited subset of investors who are trying to be legendary. So like, I'll give you an example. So how does a legendary investor think? A legendary investor will say, let's hold on a second here. What are our five cultural cornerstones of this company? Because if you're building the company to flip, that doesn't really matter. That takes time and you know, you could just be doing A-B testing and your minimum viable product and forget the rest of that stuff. So what I always say to people is, if all you're trying to do is build a product really fast and get some money to do that, it doesn't matter that much. But there are a lot of counterintuitive lessons and opportunities in building a startup that, that involve what your, is your fundamental technology advantage, how do you make your product awesome, how do you build a company, you know, how do you run one-on-one -on -one meetings, how do you run staff meetings, how do you run board meetings, uh, how do you define your company culture, how do you use compensation as a competitive weapon, how do you use recruiting as a competitive advantage, you know, and then like what category are you in? Uh, you know, are you, are you resegmenting a market? Are you defining a new market? Okay, people talk about that. What does that really mean? Like, what's your Air Wars marketing strategy? What's your provocative point of view as a company? Uh, what's the dynamic category of spend that you're trying to capture? And so, so I tell entrepreneurs, if you value those things, I deserve a discount off of the commodity money. If you don't, that's okay. I have no hard feelings. Go get the commodity money. Congratulations. Um, so, I, I, back, back to your question, I do believe that some investors contribute in a meaningful way to the probability of success in the company. Um, otherwise, there would be no Jim Breyer, or there'd be no John Doerr, or there'd be no Doug Leone, or there'd be no Don Valentine. There'd be no set of investors who've done it over and over again, because the entrepreneurs wouldn't care about them. They'd have no advantage into getting to the next deal. Yeah. Great. Yeah, TV? Um, I have a quick question. Um, it's awesome that you talk about building legendary companies. What advice do you give us as entrepreneurs when we're faced with an investor who says, we're only interested in hearing how you want to flip? And I wouldn't take their money. Right, and that's what we've done, but you know, it just seems like the landscape here wants you to talk about how you want to flip a company. And my, my response has been, if Sergey Brin and Larry Page and Mark Zuckerberg and all those guys have been given the opportunity to build a legendary company, why shouldn't the rest of us? Yeah. Well, but they weren't given. They they seized it, right? right. They they well. they they uh, they refused to accept the idea that they were going to be less than that. Um, you you know, it's just not that many people in the world really want to be legendary. You know, like not that many people in the world know that every day is a gift, and that you don't have that much time. And you should make the absolute most of it and not just kind of sleepwalk through your life. And, um, you know, there's just some investors get that and some don't. And, uh, you know, maybe some companies are in a situation of duress where they have to take money from people who don't get that. But in the end, part of having high standards is to impose high standards on all the people you surround your company with. You know, when I was early at Motive, we were trying to hire an IT person. And the IT person wasn't going to make a difference of whether we won or lost fundamentally in the market. We had to ship a product. We had to be successful. So we found an IT person who was good enough to do the job. And one of our founders, uh, Tom Bereiter, said, um, I'm a no vote. And everybody wa everybody's like, this person's clearly good enough. And he goes, I'm a no vote. Why are you no vote, Tom? And he said, well, one of our cultural cornerstones is that we hire the A, the a players, no matter what their job is. And he goes, okay, let's say we hire an A minus or B plus IT person. What, what are we telling the rest of the company about how important IT is? And like, did, when we said that we hire A players always, did we mean that? Or is that just a feel good HR sounding statement? Hmm. He goes, so I'm a no vote. And we're like, well, give me an example of what you're looking for. He goes, I'll give you an example. Last week, there was a guy who had to paint a wall in my house. And I was asking him about this certain kind of paint. 
And he said, oh my gosh, I've never used this kind of paint other than an experiment, but it was so strong that you can't even drive a tank through the wall, you know, after you've painted the wall with this kind of paint. And he's like, we need the IT version of that. You know, we need somebody who's curious. We need somebody who's just badass in their job. And he's like, I promise you, if we settle, we'll regret it. Keep looking, don't settle. And you know, it's just, and, and he won the day. He convinced everybody else in the company that he was right. And we ended up having this IT person named Susan Quimby, who was just incredible. She hired this facilities guy. I'll never forget this, Jason Selman. One day I had to travel out of town and um, I didn't get back in time because my flight got delayed and I was supposed to move my office and I'm always disorganized and behind, so I hadn't moved it. So I called Jason, I'm like, I'm really sorry I can't, I can't get my office moved in time. I'm physically not gonna be back in Austin fast enough. And he goes, well, I can, I can help move your stuff. And so I was like, you don't have to do that, I'll do it. And he's like, well, somebody's kind of moving into your office like really soon, so I'll just move your stuff. So I get to my office, when I get back, my new office, and everything was exactly where it had been in my old office. Every single book on the bookshelf which was placed in the same part of the room was exactly the same. He had taken pictures, he had taken 20 different pictures of my office so that it would be exactly right. And then went and got them developed probably, and, right? No, no, it, was, it wasn't that long ago. Okay. But like, like, how many facilities people do that? But, that? but it was this idea of everybody should be an A player no matter what their job is. There is always an A player at every job. And so it's like, get them at your company and don't settle. And in the end, it's, it's kind of like this Clay Christensen thing, right? People say, well, just this once, I don't have to have an A player. And pretty soon, just this once, I don't have to have an A player means you just quit having them. And so, you know, you just have to be, it's all or nothing. And I, I look at that as true as your investors. I look at that as true of your PR agency. I look at that as true of your external recruiters. It's like, you got to have the highest possible standards you have can have, and there's no plan B. Sorry, that was a totally rambling oh, response. Awesome. I apologize for that. <laughs> okay, we're gonna do one more. This guy right here, go for it. And on a good note, give us a good one. So people think the uh, VCs are the windsurfers or the uh, uh, the wave riders, and that they have that uh, amazing uh, ability to sense. What what is coming next? What what looks interesting? What is, what are you excited about? Okay. So uh, my basic my basic theory of the tech industry is that it does move in waves, and that um, so. We, we live in an industry that's magical. It's animated by Moore's Law. Moore's Law is the asymmetric weapon of the startup. Moore's Law tells us that every 18 months, the performance of computing will double at the same price. No matter how powerful an incumbent is, Moore's Law exerts a compound interest that can overcome any incumbent's power, given enough time. So one thing that, that I've observed for some time is that Moore's law tends to exert itself in these waves. So for example, when I was a kid, I went through the PC revolution. And then after that, there was client server. And after that, there was the internet, and then there was what turned out to be social networking, I think. Um, generally speaking, these waves last somewhere between seven and 10 years in my experience. Uh, and generally speaking, um, so, so my basic belief is that social networking is a startup wave is over. Uh, that doesn't mean there aren't valuable companies. That doesn't mean social networking doesn't matter. But it's starting to matter in the same way client server and internet and mainframes matter. Um, so then the question is, well, what's the, next, what's the next wave? And I don't know how to describe it yet, but my, 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 my instinct is that it has something to do with the fact that we're going to have billions of nodes and millions of clouds. And um, 2011 was the first year that the computer industry stopped being about computers, primarily. So 2011 was the first year that Windows represented less than 50% of internet access devices, down from 95% in 2005. 
and I think that the, that is really profound. And so, so most of the bets that I'm making today are based on sort of this world of billions of nodes and millions of clouds, and what will, you know, what will be the the new enabling infrastructure of that, and what will be the killer apps of that, and um, you know, what what will be the next sort of trillion dollar set of outcomes based on that. Let me ask you I have one final question. That is, tell us, tell us what it's like to work with uh, Ann Murico. Um. Well, I mean, so she's always, um, you know, we like to say that I'm sort of like the dolphin dad, and she's the tiger mom. So she's a little <laughs> bit tougher than I am on stuff. Um, you know, it's funny because when, when Ann first joined Floodgate, a lot of people took notice of the fact that, you know, the first partner that we brought on board was a woman. But the, 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 the significance, I think, though, is more important than that. I think that Ann is the best VC alive under 40. Hmm. And she's not the best woman VC under 40. She is the best, period, under 40. And um, by the way, she that that's a recent distinction Peter Fenton was the best under 40 until very recently in my opinion but when I look back on floodgates so far I don't know if we'll ever have an exit again I don't know if we'll ever make money again but there will be two things that we'll be able to say so far that were legendary one was that we democratized early stage financing at a time you know when we started floodgate and when Josh started first round capital you couldn't raise a million bucks in Silicon Valley. Hmm. And so, and you never realize the impact while you're having it. You're just doing something that seems to make sense. Yeah. But now I can look back on that and say, that was legendary. Hmm. You know, I mean, look at how much seed capital is now in the world. We had something to do with that. Yeah. You know, we had something to do with that happening. But the second thing was that we, we ended up, and it wasn't calculated, but um, Anne, Anne is the best VC in her generation who happens to be a woman. Wow. And how in the world did you find her? Or did she Beginner's find you? Luck. <laughs> it's a lady luck thing again. Yeah. Well, um, you know, uh, Mark Andreessen in a, in a core post that I read uh, this week said there was a question where, and it said, who, if you could have anyone angel invest in your company, who would it be? And, and Mark Andreessen listed about two names, and, and Mike Maples was one of them. And uh, just as a great a pleasure and honor for us to, to have you, and thank you for your time, and, and we really, really appreciate it. So thanks for coming.